Well, I'm really happy to have the chance to be here. Um, this is a terrific group to talk to because you all are the people who are the conduit between scientists, researchers, managers, and the visitors to Grand Canyon. So it's great to, for all of us that work here in different aspects of science or management to have a chance to interact with you and share messages with the public who come to appreciate Grand Canyon. So I brought some show and tell with me that I'm gonna pass around whilst presenting today. Um, you know, if you think about the diversity of presentations that we've had this afternoon, we talked about this fantastic presentation on mapping this landscape and using all kinds of different tools to do that. We looked at the example of the bison and the radio tracking and aerial tracking. We looked below ground at the karst and the flow of water below ground. So I'm gonna uh, introduce and, and actually put in your hands another kind of environmental sensor that can tell us a great deal of information about Grand Canyon National Park. And this environmental sensor is actually available to you if you look out the window, because every tree out there is a beautiful living organism that is feeling the effects of this rain, that is feeling this temperature, that felt the warmth of last summer, that felt the cold and the dryness of last winter, and so on, in many cases for hundreds of years. So I'm gonna pass around. Sorry about the microphone. I'm gonna pass around a couple of specimens of ponderosa pine wood. These come from here at Grand Canyon. These are from trees that when you look at them close up, you'll see that they have scars and wounds and they're, they're growing in unusual ways. That's because they were scarred by many wildfires. And if you would, just hold them by the outside frames. They're a little bit fragile on the inside. But when you look at these samples, you're looking at hundreds of years of environmental history that's contained on this small piece of wood. And we'll get to that as we talk about um, the fact that it's getting hot in here. This, this topic is a little bit hard to address. Uh, I was thinking last night as um, freezing rain was falling over northern Arizona. But uh, in, law, in the long-term picture, it is in fact getting warmer. And that affects forests, it affects forest fires, it affects uh, hydrology, ecosystems, plants, and animals of Grand Canyon. Okay, now comes. All right, that's that part. Sorry about that. Okay, got it, thank you. Um, okay, so as many of you are aware, um, conditions are getting warmer not only in this region of the world, but all around the world. And it is really uh, shocking in every case around this time of year, around the end of January or so, when figures are released from international science agencies showing what average global temperatures are, that year after year we keep setting new records. In 2018, we actually did not set a new record. We're in fourth place for last year, but third place was the year before, first place was two years ago, et cetera. So we have this, um, accumulation of the warmest years on record occurring in the last few years and predictions of increasing warmth to come. So these kinds of characteristics are seen all around the world. So we see uh, warm temperatures, this pinkish color here, much warmer in many regions of the world. And it connects to many things that impact our lives. That brief map, this is from Climate Central, is showing billion dollar disasters. And of course, natural disasters will happen all around the world and they will cost money and affect society and so on. But the cumulative impact of these disasters associated with warming is uh, a great loss to all of us, a great deal of money that could be better spent on other things. Okay, turning a little closer to home, this comes from the National Climate Assessment, which is available online. Uh, Greg Garfin and others from the University of Arizona were the leaders of this assessment. 
And here you have a couple of different temperature increase scenarios, higher emissions and a lower emission scenario. Whenever climate scientists work with trying to look at the future, they don't present one scenario. They don't say, this is what we estimate that global temperature may be in the year 2020, 2030, 2040, because it depends a lot on the emissions, the global emissions of greenhouse gases. So in a lower emission scenario, perhaps in a world that reaches agreements on use of fossil fuels, that finds alternative fuels, you might have relatively low temperature changes. In a higher emissions world, you have much higher temperature changes. You notice that even these lower emissions colors are still many degrees, three, four, five, six degrees Fahrenheit over the course of this century. Um, some of these maps started to be made some years ago. This particular report came out in 2014. You notice it's 2021 is the starting point there. We're practically there. I mean, we're only two years away. Okay, so let's take a look at what we know about our region right now. So this is precipitation data from the Flagstaff Airport. This is organized into water years. So starting in October and a fall, going through the winter, through the spring and summer of the next year until September 30th. Um, and what we see here going back to the 1950s is kind of an oscillating pattern, some extremes, some years that are quite wet, some years that are quite dry. The blue line is the trend line fit through the data. It's pretty flat. There's really not much change in precipitation in our Flagstaff data. But four out of the five driest years in this period occurred after 1995, beginning with the year 1996. The 1996 precipitation in this data set is about two standard deviations below the mean. What that means in a probabilistic sense is there's a, about a 3% chance of having a year that dry. 2002, was not quite that dry in the Flagstaff airport records, but regionally across the Southwest, 2002 from tree ring data and tree ring comparisons is about the driest year in the last 1,000 to 1,500 years. So extraordinary periods of drought, even though that average trend line has not yet changed. To give an idea of what some of these droughts look like at larger scale, these are maps showing the Palmer Drought Severity Index across the whole United States. That 1996 drought was very small and confined to our region. Look at 2002, drought across practically all of the western United States. And in the cases of fires, we had big fires in the southwest in 96. 2002, we had large fires all the way across the western United States. Okay, temperature is a different story than precipitation here in our local record. So this is the same weather station, the same calculation of the period, but we see that mean temperature is rising pretty rapidly. It has gone up on average by about one degree Celsius or somewhere around two degrees Fahrenheit in this period up until now. So the last half of the 20th century until now. The trend line has risen sharply. That increase is most noticeable since the mid-1980s. So if temperature is rising and precipitation is not changing, it gets drier. It might seem a little bit counterintuitive because it might seem that our, you know, how wet it is depends on how much precipitation there is. And so if the average precipitation is the same, we're going to have the same amount of moisture but we have more evaporation associated with warmer temperatures. So the characteristic of rising temperature with flat precipitation means that we have drier conditions. Um, this kind of change that we have observed is consistent with climate change predictions for the future as well. Um, global climate change predictions are an inexact science. Part of that is due to the fact that we don't know what future emissions scenarios are going to be, but part of it is that the globe is incredibly complicated. 
the distribution of energy, of moisture, of temperatures all around the world is a difficult thing to model. But most climate change predictions produced by climatologists all around the world suggest increasing temperatures, not a distinct trend with precipitation, but in many places, including our region of the Southwest, um, increased dryness because of that increased warmth. So when it gets drier and warmer, we tend to have increased wildfires. And in the southwestern United States, there have been step increases, increases by an order of magnitude or a factor of 10 in the size of the largest wildfires just in this relatively brief period of climate history that we've been talking about. We noticed in the, in the precipitation graph that our first major drought of recent times happened in 1996. And there were some very large fires in northern Arizona that actually were the genesis of some of the forest treatment efforts around here, like the Four Forests Restoration Initiative, um, Flagstaff Watershed Protection Program, and so on. In 2000, there was the first breaching of a 50,000 acre wildfire. 50,000 acre wildfire, really in an enormous area. By 2002, the Rodeo Chetiskai Fire, shown here in the, in the upper part, oops, sorry. When you go, when you're the last speaker, you get to watch everybody else wrestle with this thing and you think to yourself, it's not gonna happen to me, but it does. <laughs> Um, the Rodeo Chetiskai fire went to almost 500,000 acres. So 50,000 was enormous in, in the year 2000, almost 500,000 acres in 2002. We said, okay, well, that's, you know, that's the all-time record. That's the biggest wildfire ever. It took nine years, 2011, for that wildfire size to be exceeded by the Wallow fire. So we have encountered extraordinary fires. The Schultz fire on the left is the fire that burned on the east side of the San Francisco peaks in 2010. Then the flooding that you see on the bottom is along Highway 89. That's in Doney Park, east of Flagstaff, and is just a hint of the kind of social damage associated with these kinds of severe wildfires. This is some recent work from colleagues at NAU who have tracked, uh, as their title says, increasing trends in high severity fire in the southwestern US from 1984 to 2015. 1984 is when Landsat imagery became widely available and it was possible to make satellite maps of fires and determine their severity. And in each of these cases in different forest types, we see lines that are moving upwards. So let's turn to Grand Canyon and think about fire in the Grand Canyon context. So this slide comes from the fire management program here at Grand Canyon. And what they're doing is tying their plan into the overall mission and overall plan of Grand Canyon National Park. So as an overall purpose, the park is to be managed in red there to preserve and protect its natural and cultural resources and ecological processes. Um, moving to the fire management mission, underneath that, again, ecosystem processes, all these different values within the park. So it's the mission of the fire management program to manage fire in such a way as to preserve, enhance, and where necessary, restore these values. And trying to, in the, in the fire management plan of 2010, restore and maintain park ecosystems in a natural, resilient condition. Those of you who have already seen some of the fire scars being passed around, if you've looked at some of the calendar dates on there, what are some of the calendar dates that you saw? In which century? 1700s. 1700s, 1800s. So we're celebrating the centennial of the park right now, 1919. So the fires that affected these trees that are sensing, capturing information about the environment happened hundreds of years ago. And in fact, we have evidence not from tree rings like this, but from sediments in lakes, um, even in some of those sinkholes that we saw pictures of earlier. 
of charcoal residues that show that fires like that have been a part of this environment throughout the Holocene, the last 10, 12,000 years since the last ice age. The kinds of forest vegetation that we have here on the rims of Grand Canyon National Park have been experiencing fire. So when we think about this mission of protecting ecological processes and think about a natural resilient condition, then fire naturally is a part of that. And one of the things that I think is an interesting thing to talk about with your clients, especially if it's during fire season, if fires are in everyone's um, perspective, is this sort of contradiction that fire is huge, devastating, severe, destructive. Fire is frequent, common, natural, necessary in the ecosystem. And both of those statements are true, but they're different kinds of fires. They have to do with different severities of fire, maybe different seasonality, different frequency, number of years between fires. And we'll try to talk about that in the, in the last few minutes here. This is yearly fire activity at Grand Canyon. And many of the fires are in this green or light blue color, many of the acres shown here, because these are areas that are being managed for benefits of wildland fire. The areas shown in red are fires that are being suppressed because they're undesirable for ecological or management reasons. The other ones are fires that we may be burning on purpose. So I like this view because you can see it from Tucson um, of this huge cloud of smoke of, from prescribed burning on the south rim. That's not a wildfire. Oops. This is an example of resource objective burning on the north rim. So this is using fire in a natural way to allow it to play its role in the ecosystem and help maintain the forest. That means that sometimes you have to try to make compromises with other management goals. This is the North Rim entrance station being wrapped with the material they used to make fire shelters in order to protect it as resource objective fires went past in the early 2000s, in 2003 in this case. And these are crews monitoring fire behavior on the North Rim. Another resource objective fire, a fire ignited by lightning and burning under the eye of managers to try to achieve ecological goals, such as reducing fuels and keeping the forest open and helping support fire adapted native species in these environments. Now, another topic related to fire and another thing that may be of great, issue, of great concern to people visiting Grand Canyon is smoke. And smoke inevitably comes with fire. And when an organization like Grand Canyon chooses to allow fires to burn when appropriate, when ecologically necessary, that means they're also having to take an impact on another part of their mission, which is allowing visitors from around the world to come and experience the beauty of Grand Canyon. And you can experience that in a lot of ways. You can be on a raft, you can be hiking, but the great majority of people experience the beauty of Grand Canyon by standing on the rim and looking over. And the smoke does not help with that. So it's an opportunity to talk with people about the importance of fire, the role of fire, and it's also an opportunity to contrast the, the fact that if we don't have fire at times when it is appropriate, we're going to get fire at times when it is more severe, more destructive, produces more smoke, and can destroy infrastructure, can kill people, can damage our environment in ways that are very contrary to what the park is trying to accomplish. So uh, many people, and many of us uh, at NAU, at Northern Arizona University, which I guess, I'm not sure if I totally introduced myself, so I'll just back up for that. My name is Pete Foulet, and I'm a professor in the School of Forestry at Northern Arizona University. And together with many colleagues, we've been studying past fire regimes at Grand Canyon using tools like the fire scarred tree samples that are going around the room, looking at other types of information from satellites, from historical records, from photographs, from charcoal deposits, to try to get a picture of how fire operates in this system. And basically, we have a lot of diversity here. We have infrequent severe fires in low elevation, pinon juniper. 
frequent fires in the middle range of the forest, and then infrequent severe fires at high elevation. Many people, for instance, are familiar with the aspen that sprout back after fire, and so have a cycle where fires may occur relatively far apart, maybe more than a century between fires, but then the species is adapted to sprout back and create new aspen stands from that. So we'll take a look, hopefully, at some of, some of that information across the Grand Canyon landscape. So this is, uh, this is not a map, but this is another historic piece, uh, a historic diagram from a pioneering study carried out by C. Hart and Merriam in, this, in the Flagstaff area on the San Francisco peaks, where Merriam and his colleagues recognized and measured and mapped the fact that as you go up in elevation, that's the same kind of ecological effect as going north in latitude on the globe. So by the time you get to the top of the San Francisco peaks, when you're at 12,000, 12,600 feet above sea level, you are in Arizona, but you are in a micro environment, a climatic environment that is similar to being in the tundra. It is as if you have gone north to northern Canada or to Alaska or Siberia. And so the climate changes associated with the differences in air pressure and temperature as you go from low elevation to high elevation are illustrated in mountains like the San Francisco peaks and the distribution of vegetation across those elevational bands. We see the same thing here at Grand Canyon. We're looking at a, an image on the left, the satellite image of the Kaibab Plateau or the North Rim. But some of you know that the, the Kaibab Plateau is sometimes referred to as the mountain lying down because it, it looks kind of flat, it looks like a mesa, and if you're driving around southern Utah, northern Arizona, from a distance it may look as low as other plateaus and other mesas surrounding it. But actually it goes up over 9,000 feet in the highest points of the plateau right here in the center. And so there are bands of elevation associated with distinct bands of vegetation here at Grand Canyon National Park as well. It doesn't look like the San Francisco peaks, but it has almost all the same vegetation communities except for that highest elevation alpine tundra. Now, as climate warms, the conditions on this elevational gradient are likely to change substantially. So this comes from a recent modeling study. If you look on the current vegetation of the Kaibab Plateau, in the center here you see this pink color is the spruce and fir accompanied by a lot of aspen. You see that's greatly reduced by the end of the century to some very small areas. Ponderosa, this tan color has moved uphill and the large area of Ponderosa forest on the Kaibab Plateau, according to this model, it's not, we don't necessarily know exactly what will happen. It'll depend on a combination of fires, of insects, of the exact way in which climate scenarios play out. What the model is essentially telling us though is that the conditions in the year 2100 for Ponderosa pine to grow at the elevations where it currently grows, like around Jacob Lake Lodge for instance, are gonna be a lot less favorable by that point. So that change in conditions is likely to lead to ecological change. This is a glimpse across what that vegetation gradient looks like now. So we have spruce fir up on top, mixed conifer forest here, ponderosa pine. These are junipers in a pinon juniper woodland. We study the characteristics of fire regimes and what a fire regime means is not one individual fire, it's not one wildfire, whether it was severe or not, or big or not, it's the accumulation of the pattern of all of these fires, all these disturbance events, over many centuries. And so we are interested in how often fires occur, how much energy they have, what the ecological effects are, what the spatial patterns are, and so on. And if we can describe that for a certain forest community, then we have an idea of its fire regime. Basically what we have at high elevation, we have pretty wet conditions. The, that's where the water is found, as we saw in the hydrology presentation, that's where the big trees are, those trees grow well, it's pretty wet. 
When it's wet, there's a lot of fuel, but it's not that dry, so it's rarely available to be burned. You have the opposite at low elevation. In the Pinon juniper woodland, it's dry. There's not a problem with it being dry enough for a fire to burn, but there's relatively little production of fuel. The trees are small, they're spaced farther apart, there's less growth of grass and other plants. The sweet spot for lots of fire is in between. It's the ponderosa pine and mixed conifer community. We're in that community right here. Um, and then of course on the north rim, we have a lot more of that kind of forest. So we study these um, trees in, we study these forests, excuse me, in many different ways, as I said, but one of the strongest tools that we have is dendrochronology, or the analysis and dating of tree rings. So dendro is tree, chronology is time, so we're looking at tree rings over time or determining their place in time. And because these forests have always burned, they have burned through their ancestors burned in their evolution. We can find that in their characteristic traits. Um, and then we find in our living and dead material here in the forest, we have a legacy of hundreds of years of fire evidence. These forests have always burned and burning leaves scars. These scars are really quite readily visible. Um, many of you are familiar with fire scars. It's a, a great thing also to talk about with visitors. If you're in a forested community, you can see charred trees, you can see dead trees, old stumps that are carrying that information about the past fire regime. The way that you study these kinds of samples is you take uh, a small piece of wood in cross section compared to the whole size of the tree, it's a very small sliver of wood. It does not kill the tree, you don't cut the tree down, and people have done follow-up studies. This is uh, one of uh, the students, former student in our lab, following up on a sample that we took from a tree that then burned in a subsequent fire. So it's not something that involves sacrificing or damaging the tree, but we can take this piece of wood. Here are some examples of removing some segments. This is what a cross section will look like coming right out of a tree. You can see those wounds going in between the tree rings. And then here we are back in the laboratory. We take these samples, we saw them flat, we sand them down until we can clearly see all the cells of the wood under a binocular microscope. So once we can see all of these tree rings, then we can cross date the tree rings with a tree ring chronology based on climate. So essentially, the years of dry conditions lead to trees growing very slowly in that year. When we have uh, 40, 50, 60 years worth of tree ring data, we start to see those patterns match up in a unique way from tree to tree. We can create a chronology from that and match it up to new tree samples. So when we cross-state tree samples, we are not counting backwards. We do need to identify each ring, but dendrochronology is not counting of tree rings, it's dating of tree rings, determining the date in which each tree ring formed, and that allows us to work with samples from dead trees as well. If we had a dead tree and our only choice was to count, we would have to know when it died, and we're usually not gonna know that. But by being able to match patterns within the rings, going back long periods of time of cross-matching these patterns, we can determine the exact year in which each ring formed. This is the basis of dendrochronology, and as another piece of local information, dendrochronology was conceived by Andrew Douglas, who was at the time an astronomer working in Flagstaff, Arizona at Lowell Observatory. So up on Mars Hill in Flagstaff at the observatory, he was actually studying Mars, um, he got into conflicts with Percival Lowell, um, basically because Lowell argued that the canals that people saw on Mars, the lines that one could see on Mars through telescope, was an indicator of an ancient civilization. Douglas and pretty much everybody else recognized that that could not possibly be true, but it's kind of hard to argue when the boss, the person the observatory is named after, doesn't agree with you. So Douglas ended up leaving his career as an astronomer. He founded the Laboratory of Tree Ring Research at the University of Arizona. 
So uh, just to look quickly at some examples of what some of these forest types are like, here we're in the Pinon juniper woodlands, um, characterized by severe fires, but they tend to be patchy. Um, there's a study very close to here, just outside the park boundary on the, on the Kaibab, on the Tucson district of the Kaibab National Forest, where we reconstructed patterns of burning that over several hundred years led to different patches, burning with stand replacing or tree killing intensity, but relatively limited on the landscape. So you have a mosaic of different age classes of pinon juniper. Oops. As we go up in elevation to Ponderosa and mixed conifer forests, we have frequent fires tending to be more low severity in the Ponderosa, having some patches of higher severity in the wetter mixed conifer. This is uh, Clarence Dutton who reported on the characteristics of this region in this um, tertiary history of the Grand Canyon District in 1882. He writes, the trees are large and noble in aspect and stand widely apart. And that is still true on much of the Kaibab Plateau, especially the part within Grand Canyon National Park that has not been logged and still retains this kind of a characteristic, the tree trunks vanishing away like an infinite colonnade. Ponderosa pine forests are characterized by an extraordinary frequency of fire, but those fires were largely excluded from the landscape by the introduction of grazing animals and then the introduction of organized fire suppression by the Forest Service, by the Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, lots of other changes that um, today we are interested in trying to reverse, and we'll talk about restoring fire in a second. This is a chart made from, by colleagues from the University of Arizona. They took fire histories all across the state of Arizona and New Mexico, and they found years when lots and lots of these sites burned. So some of the years on the samples that are passing around the room show up in this regional chronology. 1748 is the champion year. So if you could have flown over the Southwest in 1748 in the summer, you would have seen fires everywhere. But unlike the Schultz fire, the Slide fire, the uh, Rodeo Chetis guy and the Wallow fire, in the Ponderosa and mixed conifer forest, these were not lethal fires that killed trees over tens of thousands of acres. Instead, all of this information comes from trees that survived those fires, and in fact grew for another 150 years and produced the rings that we can use to detect those past fires. You see that around the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the curve drops off sharply. That's where the effects of that grazing and fire suppression came in. But here at Grand Canyon, we still have some intact forest areas, not harvested. They were grazed, they were subject to fire suppression, but not as much. Um, we talked about Powell Plateau with the bison. I'm really sorry to hear that it's their favorite place because other than that, it's one of the more natural forest environments that we have in the Southwest. And that includes in terms of fire, here is a managed fire, fire managed for resource objectives from 2003, burning on Powell Plateau. In mixed conifer, the historic fire frequencies were a little bit longer, and because some of the trees in there are more of a Christmas tree type tree that has foliage going down to the ground, they can burn a little bit hotter like you see in that picture. But most of these big trees survive this fire. Fire like that thins out the smaller and younger ones. And then in the spruce fir and aspen forest, the natural characteristic is for this forest to experience fire infrequently. So we have this large, dense forest. There's a lot of fuel there, but it stays fairly wet. Not that many fires are gonna find conditions dry enough to burn. When they do, it tends to be a stand replacing fire, and then that's rapidly followed by regeneration, especially by aspen, but also by the conifers that seed back in. Um, another feature of the North Rim that has made it a great place for research in the Southwest is there are very few elk on the North Rim. This is part of Park Service, Forest Service, and Arizona Game and Fish Management to limit the number of elk up there. And because of that, aspen regeneration is much healthier on the North Rim than almost any place else in the state of Arizona. 
So last point here, returning fire to the landscape. This is a goal of park management. It's also a goal for the Forest Service and other agencies around here. These are fires that have burned since 1980. You can see that most of the park has had at least one entry. And then a lot of places like down here on the South Rim or on Walhalla Plateau, some of these polygons represent three, four, five different fires that have occurred in this time period. These kinds of activities also need to work in harmony with reaching out to people. So the kinds of messages we were talking about that you can discuss with clients and with visitors are also issues that are really important for school kids. Like these are kids from the Wallapai tribe in Peach Springs in the Western Grand Canyon. Um, we do outreach like this in Flagstaff, in Loop, in various communities in order to try to help people see that role of fire, try to help them see evidence from the past, like these fire scarred trees. And these kids are learning about tree rings for themselves by taking their own cores. So the final points here, um, climate warming is, is leading, is leading now. It's not a thing of the future, as we've seen from the weather data that we looked at. We are currently in a period of rapidly warming climate, and predictions suggest that we are continuing to head towards substantially more warming over the century. That leads to drought events. Those lead to big fires. There are ecosystem shifts coming. And the different, unique, evol naturally evolved forests and fire characteristics that we have in this region are going to be affected by that. But the goal of management in this area is to try to help systems adapt as best as possible, not by burning up severely in an uncharacteristically large and intense wildfire, but rather by trying to move in a, in a slower, hopefully more conservative, conservative in the sense of conservation, way into this warmer future. So with that, Thank you very much. Appreciate the chance to talk with you. It's up to you. Well, whatever. I'd be happy to. Yeah. Yeah. So I have some possible insight. The one, one element of what determines the boundary between a meadow and a forest is the disturbance regime and fire. And so a colleague at NAU, Margaret Moore, studied meadows and has some data on, some published data on migration of trees into meadows, the closing of meadows associated with the end of the frequent fire regime. There are other factors that affect this as well, though, including um, grazing, livestock grazing, not really an issue within the park, although the bison grazing may be approaching that level of intensity. And then uh, the water relations within the meadow, because another factor that separates meadows from forests is how saturated the soils are. So it's kind of a complex environment, but there is definitely uh, at least one large study um, from the basin on the North Rim about metal encroachment. The woman who led the study is named Margaret Moore, M-O-O-R-E, yeah. And if there's any other information that anyone's interested in, uh, my email is in this presentation and you can share with the group and I'd be happy to send any other information that would be useful.